Okay, everybody, welcome to the webinar today. Welcome to the webinar. Today, we have Composite Resin Mastery, Predictable Techniques for Everyday Practice. And this is a combo webinar for one of the first times for us because we have two presenters. We have Dr. Robert Margis and Dr. Marcos Vargas. Hey, guys, are you here? Yes, we are. Yes, I am too. Perfect, perfect. So I think everybody's going to be pretty excited to attend this webinar today. We have uh, a lot of people registered. And what I want to do is just a couple housekeeping items. Um, we will be asking questions at the end. I'll ask Marcos and Robert the questions or Bob the questions. Um, we may not get to all the questions. Typically, the last time we did this, there were so many questions I couldn't get through them all. It was too hard to, to see them all even scrolling through the uh, Webinar Jam uh, platform. But on the side of your control panel, your Webinar Jam control panel, you'll be able to type questions. Um, if you're on a phone, it'll be harder to see. We do recommend and did say in the emails to try and attend on desktop or laptop because it'll be easier to see the whole screen, easier to type in questions if you have them. It's just easier to make this work as opposed to on a phone. If you're on a phone, it's okay. It's just not as great an experience. So type in your questions. Let us know where you're from. If we don't get to your questions, we will be printing them out. And um, in, the, in the not too distant future, I believe we're gonna do some YouTube videos with some of the questions that we haven't answered that we think are really good and um, put them up on my YouTube channel, which has a lot of viewers and subscribers. And so if you go to, you know, the, I think it's Dr. S. Phelan YouTube. If you just Googled me, Dr. Stephen Phelan, you'd see my YouTube. I have a lot of videos there. Some of them have millions of views. You can um, check it out because we will add some composite resin mastery videos in the next few months. So that's basically it. Type in your questions. We'll do our best to answer them. Um, let us know where you're from. And I'm going to turn it over to Bob and Marcos, and they're going to tell us what we've got to look forward to today. Thanks, Stephen. It's a real pleasure to be here uh, today in this webinar with all your listeners and viewers. So I just want to say hello. I want to uh, pass it to you, Bob, for a, so you can welcome our list, our viewers and listeners, please. Yeah, welcome. Uh, it's very exciting for me to be here with you, Marcos, today, to be able to show some of the things that we've been doing over the last 35 years. Um, I've always admired everything that, that you have done in the past, and being able to do this course, this webinar with you, is really great. Oh, I agree. You know what, Bob? Um, it's an honor and a pleasure. God, my God, Bob, you, you've been a, well, let, let's tell everybody the truth. Bob is older. Uh, Bob has been my teacher. <laughs> um, and Bob is my teacher. He's my friend. And we've done a lot of work together. And I really, it's a, it's a, it's a privilege working together with you, Bob. That, that's for sure. So. Thank you for allowing me this to happen too. I'm really excited. Um, and you know what? I'm here to learn from you, Bob, too. It's just, uh, you know, I, I'm, I'm always want to learn and you being my great teacher. So it goes both ways, I think. Well, I appreciate that. I'm just going to put it out there that I'm the younger one here, guys. <laughs> <laughs> you're the one with the most hair, too. <laughs> yes, I do have hair. I'm not part of the group. <laughs> Or the club. Uh, I, I have to say one thing because Marcos is so humble. There isn't anybody that I know that is a clinician, a researcher, and a teacher all in one like Marcos Vargas. He's in the trenches every day like I am. Uh, he has a private practice. He teaches at the University of Iowa. He does research. And some of the early studies on Denton bonding, uh, his papers have been well read across the world. And so it's just going to be a lot of fun today. Hey, you have to you have to tell about yourself too, Bob. I you you tell about me, I'll tell about you. Bob is a great clinician, and he is there in the trenches. He has a prior practice in Des Moines. He's been in practice for thirty years. You have to see his practice is beautiful. Um, the patients are so happy what he does. He's very fast. He's very good. I've been there. 
numerous times, watching him, learning from him, and a lot of people has done that. So, Bob, I, you know, you are the guy there that is just in the trenches Monday to Friday. I know how you how you work with your assistants and you hygiene checks and unbelievable how you cannot manage all that and and you know what, make your patient happy, make a good living out of it, and get the satisfaction. Put your head and the pillow at night and sleep good with the work you done. So you, you don't sh don't sell yourself short, Bob. Okay, thank you so much. So as a matter of uh, disclosure, we want to tell you that we have uh, collaborate, collaborated, advice, and received support from several dental manufacturers. And you are going to see us using different materials, different brands. There are things that I like. There are things that Bob like. But always we want to disclose. Uh, and the truth is that we are not receiving any money from any dental manufacturer for doing this webinar or for any of these or these modules we are doing, we haven't received a penny from no manufacturer. So um, today, really, we are going to talk to you about what we know, what we believe, and what we do in our practice daily. You are going to see that also is part of what we teach at the University of Iowa. All the cases that you're going to see is the cases that I, Bob has done in this practice, what I've done in my practice in pretty much real time. I'm here to tell you that this is not any Photoshopping. We have not altered any of the dental work. Yes, we have maybe make this images smaller. We might cut it for better uh, didactic, but again, no alteration of the dental work. As Stephen said at the beginning, uh, there you are going to type your questions, and uh, the, we're going to at the end answer as many as we can, time permitted. And overall, most important, what we really want to do with this webinar is to teach you something that can you that you can use in your practice tomorrow. For us, when I talk to Bob about this, it's like when you go to a meeting and you get a little nugget of information, you is like, oh my God, these just pay the price of admission. So that's our goal. That's what we want to do. We want to give you as many tips as we can for you to use in your practice for your better dentistry and to make your patients happier in healthier. So the objectives uh, for today, what we'll be doing in this webinar, it's going to be, we're going to start by discussing a freehand diastema closure technique. That's one, of the, that's one of the things we want to do. We're going to show you some slides and we're going to discuss with Bob back and forth how we did this type of uh, uh, work in our practice. We're also going to talk to you about how we, how we charge for this and discuss the, some of the codes that we might use. We are going to talk a little bit about managing wire spot lesions on anterior teeth. Probably you have several patients that might come to your practice and come with white spots. And it's like, well, what white spots? I cannot do it because bleaching not necessarily is going to do it, but there are microabrasion or techniques that we'll describe a little bit. We also are going to talk about class twos. We're going to do um, a little bit, again, a little show, showing you how to get good contacts, no overhand, select the matrix, uh, maybe talk a little bit about bulk field materials and what is our feeling nowadays about it. We are going to talk about product selection, selection for finishing and polishing, also how we select resin composites, what is a little bit out there for uh, you to know a little more about them. We also are going to talk about a little bit bonding. We are going to talk a little bit about how to prevent postoperative sensitivity uh, when you're bonding, because a lot of people have this problem. So hopefully we can give you a nugget or two there how to prevent postoperative sensitivity. Uh, we'll be happy to do it. So now I'm going to show you some before, we're going to show you some before and after cases. In kind of the type of dentistry, just to for you to see the things that we do and the results we are getting with the techniques we are using. 
So this is a very young girl. She's like nine years old. And she comes to my office for a second opinion because somebody wants to do a porcelain veneer in that case. And of course, the mom is, I heard that these things are done for Hollywood people. I really don't want my daughter to have something like that done at that age. And in this particular case, to me, and probably for a lot of you, it's clear that needs to be a composite resin. So that's what we end up doing in this case, a little composite resins. And when you see something like this, the goal of our work is to blend, to disappear with the dentition and a conversation distance. Nobody can see the where the composite ends. And that's what we wanna we wanna do. And that's what I think we take pride on in what we do. That we really create restorations that not necessarily are the greatest aesthetic, maybe in some cases, you will see some of the cases, but really they blend really nicely by techniques like doing a good cavity preparation, doing good bonding, doing, doing good material manipulation, good finishing. And those are the things that composite resins can give you. And I'd say when I look at this case, the beauty of this case is the surface texturing and the anatomy. You could have a perfect composite and the perfect color, but if you don't get the shape right, the shape will trump anything about the color. So if you can make it look fat, it's not going to look good, even if the color is perfect. So being able to do surface texturing, I think, is critical. Uh, and that's very important for Marcos and I. Absolutely. Uh, I'm sure everybody's seen cases like that, right? In your practice, you see a, a patient comes, and then they're complaining about the restoration they have. You can see in the upper right central incisor, and the complaint of the patient or the concern is that it looks too, gr it looks too gray, right? And the, yeah, it looks too gray, but... The question I always ask, it looks too gray because the shade selection is wrong or maybe the opacity of the material is wrong. Is it too translucent, too opaque? In this particular case, it's not the shade that I think is wrong. What I think is wrong is the opacity of the material that I was used. So that's very important to understand too that shade is part of the equation. And like Bob mentioned, shape is the other part of the equation, but the opacity of the material is the the next part of the equation that we need to figure it out when we do it. And when you're using a composite from one manufacturer and it says A1 and the other one says A1 from another one, those A1s may be different. And we're going to try to show you how we do shade selection. When do you use a dentin shade? When do you use a body shade, a universal shade, an enamel shade? Because this right here is about technique and material selection. So how we solve that case? Well, we solved it by, again, getting a good shade selection and getting a, the opacity of the material that is going to blend really nicely by getting good contact, good anatomy, good surface texture. And these restorations kind of blend into the structure and blends in the mouth and blends in the smile. And that's, again, the goal for these cases. A little more complicated case that you can see uh, right here. This is a 12-year-old boy that comes to the practice and, you know, of course, who cares? It's not the boy, 12 year old boys, they're just kind of a reckless. I was, I was reckless at 12 year old. And he had an accident and broke a tooth. And they put a composite. They eventually they did a root canal. The tooth turned dark. And what am I thinking? Am I thinking a crown? Am I thinking porcelain veneer? Well, again, the age of the patient dictates to me a lot what I'm going to do. I don't want to start with a crown at this age because I don't want to start the clock. I want to, you know, push, 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 delay, delay, delay the treatment. So for this particular uh, case, what we did is we did some internal bleaching. right? Then we did some external bleaching. Because kind of with these cases, you kind of play a little bit with the internal and the external at the same time to get a nice, even shape. Once you get the cervical area to match the cervical of the adjacent tooth, then we replace the old restoration with resin composite. And again, you might say, well, looks good. Yes, it's a, it's a combination, again, of a cavity preparation, of a shade selection, opacity selection, layering, and contouring and finishing that allows you to have a result like this. So, Marcos, when you look at this case, do you do the internal bleaching yourself or do you send it to an endodontist or do you have any 
uh, tricks to say, or do you do like a cotton pellet? Do you use sodium perborate? I will do these cases personally. My, I do myself. I like to do them. You know, after the root canal, I have a very good endodontist. They do the root canal. They seal the entrance, and we know when we talk about the case, what is going to be restoratively, what we are going to do. They put a barrier at the level of the bone, and then I'm going to internally bleach it with sodium perborate, close it two, three weeks, you know, multiple appointments, sometimes takes, depends on the tooth, and then comes back. Once I start doing the sternal bleaching, then I will go with the restoration. That's kind of the way we would like to work these cases. Uh, just to another case, this is a case that the tooth is dark underneath. It's coming dark, and um, yeah, you can say, well, I'm going to put a porcelain veneer and put it a crown. Again, young patients, you can see. So what I want to do is direct resins, right? Like when you look at this case, it's a good case. Maybe it's slightly opaque when you compare with the lateral. Uh, you might see a little bit of imperfections of the blending of the layers of the cervical portion. You can see some of the margins up here, a little bit of the layering. But in general terms, when you are working in a conversation distance, they look pretty good. So she was quite happy with the result. And unfortunately, um, she started working in the Marine Corps and she hadn't seen it in years. Another case here. This is um, a little older in the 30s lady and she has a case in which she is unhappy about the appearance of those restorations in the front. So when I look at something like this, I am saying, yes, I have to change these two restorations, but I'm also looking at the gingival health, right? I don't have a very good gingival health there. So as soon as I remove those restorations and I change them, the papilla is going to move up because it's going to heal and then and may end up with a black triangle. So in that case, we did some internal external bleaching. And knowing also when you have a diastema, like it was a resultant after removing those, we know that it's quite important to understand where the bone, the crest of the bone is. Because when you want to prevent a black triangle, the distance from the crest of the bone to the contact point should be about four to five millimeters. If the distance is more than that, the likelihood of end up with a black triangle increases. So that's quite important that when you do cases, you understand that fact of having the distance from the bone to the crest. So will you normally set your contact point four to five millimeters by looking at an x-ray and let the patient know that this may fill in. Uh, it will fill in, but it might take some time. Yes. So a case like that, I will have a uh, radiograph made. And in the radiograph, I will make the, dish, the distance, measure the distance from the crest of the bone to the incisor ledge, right? And then I will measure the crest to the bone five millimeters down. And then I measure that distance to the edge of the incisor ledge, and that's going to be the length of my contact. So I prevent a uh, black triangle in that case. Black triangles, you know, people hate them. Uh, well, not everybody, but a lot of people hate them. So another, maybe a little more aesthetic case in this case. This is a young lady that comes to me. She happens to be a dental assistant and she wanna improve her smile because she doesn't like those a lot that are inside. So again, very young. Also, part of Jan is that she doesn't have the money to pay for maybe crowns or porcelain veneers. So I think some of those cases I will do with porcelain, you know, a small just additive with porcelain. And some of these cases I'll do it with resin. But this particular case is because of finances, she decided to do uh, direct resins. So what we did in this case is to do composite buildup. Now, when you did this case, did you use a wax up and maybe a lingual matrix or do you like to freehand cases like this? 
I do like to do a wax up in a case like this. I think is the result is will be more predictable and faster because I'd rather spend a little more time in the lab and less time in my chair because that's the most uh, expensive part of the, of the, in the economics of the office, the your chair time. So I will do a wax up and I don't have to really do a mock-up maybe in this particular patient because she knows that she doesn't like him. She has an idea what she wants and I understand what she wants, bigger laterals. So I, don't, I do a wax up so I bring the lingual shell and then I can do it much faster and allow me to get a more predictable result for her. As far as like a time, chair side time is very important because you see these beautiful cases and they don't tell you that it took all day to do this. Like, for instance, like something like this, to me, you know, should be very efficient using a lingual matrix. What would you say a time would take for this? Uh, this case is about, about an hour, an hour, an hour and 10. Since the patient sat, sits in the chair, just get out of it. We try to make it, you have to make it efficient. If not, just there is no profit into it. That what is important, not the whole thing, but it's quite important. So... But an hour or so, you can do those, you know, with the technique, with the, with the matrix and everything. Um, in, this, in this case also, it happened that um, there was a little crumb lengthening. You can see a little 7 and 10. 10 is not healing as good as I, we wanted it to, but I've seen the patient two years later, and she was uh, very good about it and, and quite happy about it. Other cases. When, when I see this right here, I always see that chip, and you see people want to put composite on that edge. And normally, if the bite is tight, it's going to break off. So was this an orthodontic case preoperatively, or how would you handle these cases? Yes, this was a preoperative. My mind got a good eye, Bob. This was a preoperative case and went through ortho. So because sometimes what you have is the occlusion, you get in the pathway, and then you are chipping and wearing your teeth. So the idea is to move those teeth out of that pathway. And then when you move them out, you end up with black triangles, um, a little diastemas. And what do I do? I'm going to do a full set of porcelain veneers? No, patient is not necessarily interested in doing that. And I think I can get a good result by doing resin composites. So what I will do is do some bleaching and then a little addition of resin composite just to close the black triangles and close the diastema. And the bleaching in this case worked really well. Look at that, how white those are. He was happy about that. Um, the next case that I want to show you, it's uh, she's a dentist. And I have a lot of these, like dentists, right? We want in our mouths, gold. Like that's what we always choose to do gold, right? And in the interiors, we are conservative. We don't want anybody else taking up our teeth. So she comes to me and says, well, please, would you please do a uh, resin composite? So in, part in that particular case, that's what we did. A little composite resins. We use a couple of opacities. This is going to be a body opacity to block, because it's a class four, to block the light going through, and then to create a translucency, I am going to use a enamel-like material to create the depth, so the light going in and out. I think that's really important when you look at something like this, because a lot of times if you're using the wrong material, the value is really low. So using either a dentin shade or a body shade will help you raise that value and then put the enamel shade now, I find, too, that if I make my enamel shade too thick, sometimes that will lower the value of the tooth. Yes, yes, yes. You know what? I th I, that's a great, great, great point because we think about layering and putting two layers, but the thickness of the layer is what makes a huge difference. All right, what? I, we, I don't think we ever talk about it, this, but Stal Italiano is the ones that I think historically came out with a really no a number. When you are layering, your final layer should be about 0.5 millimeters of enamel. In that way, it doesn't look too opaque, doesn't look too translucent. That's been my experience. And, and, and one of the other things that I've always enjoyed is when you do your studies and you say, okay, I have a 2 millimeter thickness of composite, 
my dentin is one millimeter, my enamel is one millimeter. Now I'm using the same composite and I make my dentin a millimeter and a half and my enamel a half a millimeter. They're still both two millimeters, but the value is different. And so sometimes you think, well, how am I using this material? And I get the result. If the thicknesses are different, you're going to come up with a different shade. Absolutely. And that's the beauty of understanding the thickness of your material. Um, the next case that I want to uh, show you is a fluorosis. All right. This is a young lady that um, you can really, I don't have to tell you that probably she's unhappy. She's unhappy about this. And then when we're doing these um, type of cases, I am thinking about it because there are different techniques to improve this, correct? Some people say, well, we have to do infiltration. Some people say we have to do bleaching. Some other people have to do microabrasion. So when I look at something like this, in some of these cases, I will use a combination of these techniques, right? Sometimes I will start with bleaching, sometimes I start with microabrasion, sometimes with infiltration. This particular case that you are seeing the before and after now, I decided that I needed to do some bleaching first and then um, some microabrasion to remove the, the, the superficial fluorosis. Now it's important the diagnosis of what it is, and not only diagnosis of the, what it is like fluorosis or uh, tetracycline, but the depth, right? Because if I'm saying microabrasion removing surface, I have to know if I can do microabrasion to remove the stains. So I have to have an, an idea how deep they are. And I know how deep they are because I kind of transilluminate and that tells me a little bit the depth of lesions. When I notice that they are shallow, then I will do microabrasion. So when I look at this case too, some dentists would say, we can't get rid of those spots. We're going to put composite over the top or we're going to do porcelain veneers. You just don't want to do that on a young patient like this. I think understanding the different chemicals that you use, because I remember in the 80s and 90s, we were using Prima. That was from Ted Kroll. And, you know, it's got a mild hydrochloric acid. And I know that some of the techniques, and if we have time, we can go into it, but you use different uh, uh, different strengths of, of the acid, correct? Yes, and every every company has a different concentration. So that's quite important. Depends what company you use, depends on the concentration. The time of application changes quite a bit in those cases that you're doing microabrasion, infiltration, and all things like that. And there are already a commercially available products to do this. This, to me, is a case that I think I see all the time in my practice, right? So... Uh, she comes to me and she wants to have a better smile and her concern is the darkness of her teeth and she's post-ortho and some of the chipping that she's had some in the past. So when I'm looking at this, I try to look at different things. Color is their concern. So I'm listening to the patient. Shade is a concern. Decay is also a concern in the disparity in the incisal alleges. So we start by doing some bleaching and bringing everything pretty much like an even nice canvas. And then, then we can go ahead and change that resin composite that she has there. And a little bit I will do is a little augmentation with resin composite. That's what I kind of call it, augmentation. And this is the result for that particular lady. And this is very pretty much one shade of composite. I, this is, happens to be, I think, Evan S, enamel white from clinician's choice. Again, we like to use different materials, maybe for different applications. So when you start seeing then the before and after, obviously for her, it's an it's a impactful difference. And I like to show the before to my patients and then the after. The day that I'm done, when they, they come to recall, because it's impactful how they start and how they finish. Sometimes it's very important to show that because they forget how they started, right? So you want to show this the, the before when you started it. And in my experience, patients like that, that they are very happy, bring more patients to your practice. Yes, and, and when I talk about composite resins, it's more about um, not considering composite a second-class citizen. I think composite resins are, are great material. 
And you really can't call yourself a cosmetic dentist if you don't do direct resins. I like what Buddy Mopper says. If you don't do direct composites and understand how to do them, and you're just depending on your laboratory technician, you're just a cutter and a paster, and it makes your laboratory technician look good, not you. So it takes practice, but it's a simple approach once you understand the preparation design, the bevel, uh, the opacity, shade selection, it gets quite simple. Yes, yes. And simplification of those concepts is what I think we've been, we've been done through the years, Bob. Um, the next case, case that I want to show you, I want to jump a little bit into maybe class fives, right? So you have a fraction lesions. Uh, and the first question that comes to mind is, when do we restore a fraction lesions, right? Do we restore them all the time? Do we restore them when we restore these? What do we do? Glass ionomer, composite resin. Well, it can be both, right? And 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 the factors are depends on the aesthetics you are looking at. Depends on the caries risk assessment of the patient, and that's when we make a determination. What do we do when the patient comes to us because these are aesthetic? Probably the, re the way we are going to restore this is through resin composite, again, because of aesthetic nature. If a patient comes in here because it has uh, decay, my take on this will be to do glass iron. And another question that I always get from people is, they debone, they come off. How many of those you have, Bob, coming off? I just don't see it in my practice. Occasionally, maybe, but not very often because I understand how to bond to root and sclerotic dentin. There's techniques on how to do that, and I just don't see that in my practice. Occasionally, you may have one, but overall, no. And, he, and you know, bonding to sclerotic dentin is quite difficult. And then I think that with the proper techniques, it can be done and it's successfully you can have this last for a very long time. I also, we talk about retention. Would you make retention on this? I wouldn't make retention. The only thing I would do is bevel the, the enamel a little bit, blend it into the tooth because I don't want retention where the filling stays in and it might be loose, but you're going to get decay under it and it doesn't fall out. I want my restoration to fall out before I would get decay on it. Absolutely. But you was, that's why you want to bond it properly to both dentin and enamel. Absolutely. That's something that I 100%, you know, um, bonding to dentin, it's, it's more difficult than bonding to enamel. The next case that I want to show, it's a little, maybe a little more uh, complicated, a little more for a made advanced type of uh, situation. I don't think I was doing these cases right away. I took me a, several years maybe to do these cases. And Bob kind of tests to, you had to put some effort, you had to practice. And I remember coming here to visit Bob, you know, as my teacher, my mentor, and we would practice. We'll practice this in, in dental forms and how to obtain this, how to simplify the technique, how we teach it. Uh, to the point that um, some of these cases, you can do it very, very efficiently. You know, in a case like this, she, had those for 50 year plus. So uh, my choice maybe is do porcelain veneers. My choice also wouldn't be to have a, a graft, cover those roots and then porcelain veneers. I think it wouldn't be in a beautiful case, but financially she cannot afford porcelain veneers. And she tells me, well, you know what? The first set lasts me 15, 16 years. Well, I'd be happy if you do me a new set that is going to last me the same amount of time. So, okay, then we understand it's a cosmetic case. And you notice those restorations have not come off. They can, like we say, they can chip, but they, will, they should not come out because they are bonded to enamel. And the bonding to enamel is the best bond we have. So properly, they should not come off. And that's an example that they don't come off. I know. And, and when you look at this, composite veneer success is spelled E-N-A-M-E-L, enamel. If you have enamel to bond to, you're going to have a good restoration. You may get a chip, 
You may get a little stain maybe once in a while if it's on dentin, but it's never going to come off. Absolutely. You notice in this case, the composite material, it's an old generation, you know, a stain, a discolor, but didn't come off. So in this case, we did um, some resin veneers for this case. She was, she was happy when we were done with the case. Um, we did um, eight, eight, seven veneers, say seven or eight, eight resin veneers. And again, it takes a little time to do them. I would say this case took me two and a half hours since the patient sat down in the chair and the patient left. And again, this happens all, to be only one single shade of composite. Because if I'm going to layer something like this, then it doesn't, I cannot afford it to layer. Because if starting to layer, it takes me longer time. And then I'm also start, you know, not even breaking even, but losing money. You want to you wanna be, again, profitable. So it takes me two, two and a half hours to do a case like that. And the patient is quite happy. When she returns, um, she's ecstatic. She's just thanking me about it for it, thanking the, the practice. I remember she bringing donuts. And again, very happy with the result. And very appreciative that I didn't tell her that she needed to have porcelain veneers because she's gone to other places that they'd want to do porcelain veneers. You know, when people ask me how long these things are going to last, you know, it really depends on what they do with their teeth. If they use their teeth as tools or weapons. Obviously, they can break or chip something. You know, when they get done with this, I tell the patient, remember, these are jewels, not tools. <laughs> and I, I don't want them to be tearing things off with their teeth. But composite resins like this can last a long, long time. All right. Do you, I, one other question, I always get this. Do you, mouth, do, you, do you do mouth guards for this? You know, normally I don't do a mouth guard, but sometimes if I'm doing a big case, I'll throw a mouth guard in there um, just so that if they ever break something, I'll say, were you wearing your mouth guard? <laughs> <laughs> but, but it just really, if they're not a grinder or a clencher, I don't think a mouth guard necessarily is important. I think that's also with composite resins some overlooked factor. It's the um, the fact that we think, oh, resin don't last. Resins do not last, and I think it's wrong. I think when you evaluate the occlusion and the occlusion, and Steve Stephen has a great occlusion course if you haven't seen it. But if you check the occlusion, you balance that occlusion with your anterior guidance, your uh, canine guidance. All those in working in, in group, and the, the patient doesn't have parafunction, this should last you for a long time. If I have a patient that will have parafunction, maybe resins will be my, wouldn't be my choice, or resin plus a, a night guard. That will definitely be my, my um, go, way to go in that case. Longevity, we've been talking a little about longevity, and I'm going to show you a case here. Again, this is a patient unhappy about what? Unhappy about the coloration, tetracycline stain, a mild type. You can see there are some brown and gray discolorations in the diastemas, right? So she does what are concerns that she has. How do we address those concerns? There are very good literature out there telling us that we can do bleaching in tetracycline stain teeth. And after doing the uh, bleaching, we then can do a little minimal invasive with resins. And what do we do? We follow these patients for years. This happens to be 10 years after, 10, 12 years after. I think it's 10 years maybe. And they're still looking good. Um, color of the restorations is maintained. Maybe the margins are as not as good as it, as it could be. But in general terms, conversation, distance, smile, she's quite happy about it. Um, if I show you through the years, this happens to be a 15-year-old case, the same 15 years later. And we are seeing, starting to see a little discoloration of the resins, still matching the opposing, but you know what? Um, with widening toothpaste and things that people is doing, it's, it's unfortunate that resins are not lasting longer because of that, because the patient tends to bleach. Then over the years, she started using uh, white strips over the counter, right? Without me knowing, because I would have tell her, 
the white strips are going to change the color of your teeth, but they are not going to change the color of the restorations. So that's um, a photograph 18 years later that you can see there. And one time she came, and this is what I saw, right? And I was like, oh my, oh my God, so why so much difference between the laterals and the canines? And you really can see that she was really bleaching those teeth with the white strips. And then I asked her, I said, oh yeah, I've been doing the white strips. They look better, don't they? And it's like, yeah, but, but for her, they look better. So who am I to say that there is no right? Right? When a patient comes back, you know, let's say they're coming back for their prophies and stuff. In my practice, I don't want my hygienists to use any type of prophy paste. I prefer them to use like an aluminum oxide because if they're using a, a like a fluoridated paste, it has a tendency to want to dull my composites. And I was just curious because we never really discussed, do you want them to have prophies and, and what do you have them use? Uh, my hygienist uses the finest, finest, finest um, um, pomace that I can find. And there's company, Iboclar has very fine grid paste for these type of situations. But this takes maintenance, right? Anything that we do uh, takes a little maintenance uh, to the profis, a patient coming back to the office. And this photograph is 25 years later, and still she's happy. She doesn't want to change it. Maybe for us as a dentist, I love to change it. But she's quite happy, and I and I have a 27 year photograph because she just came back. I didn't, I didn't had a chance to put him in the presentation, but 25 years, it's great. Knowing you, 25 years ago, that had to be a microfill, maybe Durafill or something, because when I look at that, the polishability was still good. It, it was an excellent material. Exactly what I was doing. <laughs> how, how, how you know? I remember <laughs> the Durafill back then. Well, because then he, you know, yeah, the Durafill, those are Durafill. Unbelievable. Well, see, I keep learning from you, Bob. <laughs> but yes, microfills tend to be like that. They self-polish. Now, we're going to start getting a little bit, um, moving away from the cases and the possibilities that I'll be doing with resin to really teach you a little more about step-by-step -step how to do a diastema closure. And I'm going to show you, uh, we're going to start showing you a case that um, we did. And it's a small diastema, right? When you look at this, patient was unhappy about um, the diastema. She was also unhappy about the color of her teeth. So bleaching was done. Believe me, I do a lot of bleaching. So when I'm looking at diastema closure, why do I believe are the couple of things that are going to increase my success. And one is going to be a proper shade selection, right? That's key, shade selection, very important. At the same time, key doesn't mean to spend three, four, five minutes. I can, we can select a good shade in about 15 to 20 seconds. And I think it shouldn't take you any longer to do a good shade selection. This happens to us. I'm sure it's happened to all of you that you start looking at a shade and the A1 looks good. And all of a sudden the B1 looks good. And all of a sudden the B2, D2, everything just looks good, right? Because the eye gotta get tired. That's one of the things that we need to prevent. When you select a shade, be brief, right? And the other is opacity selection when you are doing a diastema because it's very different that you have a class five, a class three, or a class four. So the opacity selection when we do is materials come nowadays as very opaque that imitate dentin. They come as enamel that imitate enamel. Some materials come in an opacity intermediate between enamel and dentin, like body. And some become very, very translucent. So why do I choose for this case? Well, depends on the width of the diastema. If the diastema is very small as this case is a millimeter or less, or I'm adding a millimeter, my choice will be enamel because it blends really well. And you know, in the proximal area, the teeth tend to, tend to be translucent, the light goes through. What about a thicker, a wider diastema? Maybe three millimeters, four millimeters diastema, some of those big ones. Then if you do enamel by itself, it would not be good because the darkness of the mouth starts showing through that diastema. 
So in those cases, you might use a combination of a, a body for the back to block the light and enamel to give the depth. So those are the kind of things that we are looking when we are trying to do a um, diastema closure. So kind of the step-by-step -step that we do in these cases, I like the rubber dump. I like to place a rubber dump pretty much, I will say nine out of 10 cases that I do. I don't use them when the patient cannot tolerate the rubber dumps, claustrophobic. Actually, this past week I had a patient that I almost had to call the 911 because he got claustrophobic with the rubber dump. So I immediately had to remove it, calm it down, and he was fine, and we ended up doing the restoration with the, without rubber dump. But not everybody um, can, can, can have the rubber dump in their mouths. So there are other techniques, optragates, that we, we can use in these cases. So when, you, when you're doing this rubber dam, you know, I've seen you do it, and, and I do it like, like you do, it could take less than like 30 seconds to put this rubber dam on. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I think, I think when I talk to my, and demo to my students, I say, well, you know what? There are a few things that you can do to help yourself put in a rubber dam. One is to punch the smallest hole you can find. And second one, put lubricant. And by doing that, it goes in 30 seconds. The rubber dam is done, right? So I think it's a lot of practice too. But to me, the key is the small holes in the lubricant. So also you notice I pack a ligature. You notice right here, I, I have a ligature in the upper right and uh, in the both central inside. So what it does is inverts my rubber dam but also my rubber dam, you notice, Bob, is pushing my papilla. So remember, I already measured how much the distance from the incisal ledge to the long contact do I have to make to not end up with a black triangle. So now I can push with my rubber dam, but also pushing with the rubber dam, I have access to the cervical area to do a very good uh, uh, diastema. Next step. Preparation. My preparation for diastemas is basically cleaning the enamel and etching. Is that all the time? Most of the time. Because in some of those cases, you have a tooth that is facially positioned, more facially positioned than the other one. So you might maybe take a little bit here, add a little bit here, but those are kind of a little more uh, complicated diastemas. So I, I use a prep start in my office as far as micro etching the teeth. Do you like using a prep start? Do you use a prep start? I have a prep start too. And I, I have the H2O, prep start yep. H2O. Yep, yeah, from that, Danville Engineers. From Danville Engineers. And the beauty of that is that it's, it, the H2O stands because when you are micro abrading or air abrading, it puts a cloud of water around the sand so you don't find sign anywhere in your office when you are doing this. But sandblasting is a great way to clean your preps, clean plaque, Clean everything, biofilm and everything. And I see that you're etching because when you you over etch, obviously, because you don't know where that margin's going to stop. Correct. That, and that, uh, that's what I don't call it over etch. Yep. You know what I mean? Yeah. <laughs> because I'm, I I'm know etching. that I want this restoration to blend, right? That's a key. Blend. And so when it blends, to me, the key to blending is going to go from a composite that has certain thickness to a diminished thickness in the margin, kind of blend, like a feather edge. So if I'm going to feather edge this, I want that feather going towards the distal to be bonded. So if it's bonded, I don't call it a flash. Yes. I call it just, it's the margin. So that's what I etch way beyond what I think I'm going to take my resin. So that's what you see far. And I do them both at the same time, etching them. That's my technique. Some people likes to do one tooth first, and then the other one. And there's advantages and disadvantages to both. And knowing when to use what technique or what technique you use, you like to use, it's key to end up with a good estima, a result. So after looking at um, the etching, you can see a very nice edge surface. Then the next step, I'm going to place my adhesive. Uh, I'm, I'm in this case, I'm using a universal adhesive. Universal work really well in etch enamel and perfect case for, for something like that, just basically one adhesive. 
And I think the important thing to point out here is when you're placing that adhesive and you're 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 letting it dwell for 15, 20 seconds, when you're air thinning that, I think it's really important that when you're air thinning that you don't force the adhesive down into the sulcus and have a space, you know, that can actually lock in where you can't get the composite down below the gum line. It actually forms like a little um, ledge. So you're very careful, obviously, when you're blowing this adhesive. Yeah, that's a very good point, a point, Bob, because that's what you don't want it to adhesive to pull. You might even be full polymerization, run a mylar strip, because you pull it here, you will not be able to have a very good margin if you compose. Great point right there. Great, great point. So now um, I'm going to polymerize that. And after polymerization, of course, we need to say that we need to have a good light. No doubt about it. Then I'm going to start to do the diastema one tooth at a time. So I am going to do whatever I choose to do, the upper right or upper left central incisor. So I'm going to apply enough amount to build up the whole proximal surface. So I'm going to apply it um, just a strip maybe, or if I like to use tubes, I place it on the facial surface. Uh, in the next slide, you can see I'm smearing. You see how it goes from thick to thin towards the middle of the tooth? That's what I was talking about because that is going to allow the material to disappear onto the facial surface. At the same time that I'm smear this, after I finish this, I want to roll and push this material around so I'm building the whole proximal. When you are doing this, it's very important, like Bob mentioned before, you do not want to have overhangs in the cervical. Those are the words to clean. Because you will have an overhang or excess in the facial or the lingual, that's easy to clean. The interproximal is the is most difficult to clean. So I make sure that I have a very good gingival margin. And then with my brush, I kind of like brushes, because the brush, now I'm going to brush it, push it, run it around, and smooth it. So that instrument that's going up under the gum, that's a very, very thin instrument. Do you have a favorite one you like using? This happens to be a IPC, a thin blade IPC from Cosmedent. I like it. I like that material. What do you like, Bob? Yeah, I like. I love the Cosmedent instruments, those, those long blades. I also use the REJ4 from, from Clinician's Choice because it's a very thin one. The other one is like the new one, the Ninja. The ninja from very, the very, very yes, thin. Yes. And when you're using this brush, do you do you put anything on your brush, or do you, you know, think you, you know need what? To? The, the, the material that I really like. You notice my brush, my brush right here has a. It's kind of like a resin. It's resin. It's not alcohol. It's not bonding agent. I love to use brush and sculpt from Cosmedent. That's a great material. And but you know what? I am not pushing. I put in a coat, right? I don't put in a coat. I'm priming my brush because I want the brush to glide. Yes. All right. Now, one of the things that we have not mentioned, Bob, here is what composite are we using? And believe me, there is a lot of very good composite out in the market. This happens to be Filtech Supreme Ultra Enamel. And what I like of this material is that it doesn't stick to the instrument has a nice consistency that I can shape it. It doesn't slump that I have to hurry up. I can, I can move it with the brush and keep their shape. But there's other materials out there. Evanescence, for example, has shown is a good one too. You kind of like to, um, Ivo Clark's... Um, Tetric Prime is a nice new one. Empress. Empress, direct. But I, I tell you what, I, I love Filtech Supreme. I love Evanescence, and especially for diastema closures because it's a stiffer composite and you can do a nice pull-through technique when we get to that. You'll see it's not sticky and won't stick to your band. Quite, yeah, I, I think, and you will notice that much, the most of the techniques that we are going to talk to you about are techniques with materials that they are not as sticky, right? Because the materials that are sticky require maybe a little different technique. So you will go ahead and we'll like cure, and then I want to like cure from the facial and the lingual, and pretty much I have one diastema buildup. Another question that I get is the width. Bob, how do you control the width? Well, normally what I'll do is 
I, I measure, I use a caliper, I use the Denta gauge, you know, and I'll try to measure one and, and see how close I can get. To me, the most important thing is just making sure that it's vertical. I want it to be as symmetrical as possible, but, um, you know, more importantly is the vertical. What do you, how do you, do you measure yours or do you, what analogy do you use to try to get those shapes? I, you know what, I, 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 for a long time, I, when I, I learned this technique, I will, um, with, from Jerry then, he, he would use always calipers, you know, just the two point calipers. But then to me, one day I went to buy shoes, running shoes, right? And the, the, the salesman, I say, well, you know, for whatever reason, I feel like one shoe is smaller than the other one. And he says, no, you have two different size foot. Your foot, the right foot is different than your left foot. And I say, what? Kind of like, are you insulting me here? And the guy says, no. What happened is that most people has different size shoes, different size feet. And then also hands. And I look at my hands and maybe one is smaller than the other one. I look at my ears and one is different than the other one, different shape. And then I went to the literature in natural teeth are smaller and bigger than the other ones. So it done to me that why am I spending so much time trying to make it perfect size when in nature, they are not the same size, even further. You know what I did, Bob? My dental students, they will come and they will have very small diastemas, right? Maybe 0 0.2, 0 0.3 millimeter diastema. And then I will close them, just mock it up first to show them how it look at expense of one tooth. So I will look and then which one is smaller? And that's the one that I build. And I will give them the mirror and they will say, oh, it looks amazing. Oh, it looks great. They will never, ever, nobody's so far been able to tell me that I have done one instead of two, right? Because but that diastema has to be very, very small. Most important, I agree with you, has to be vertical, has to be parallel to the midline. So from there, now I have to do the second one, correct? So what I'm going to do for the second one is to basically, I will start adding material to the second tooth. In the first tooth, remember, we had the room to push the material through the lingual and fill it in. For the second tooth, we don't have that luxury of be able to push and turn the material around. So because I know that, what I'm going to do is build just a facial shell. So again, I will do the same procedure that I've been doing, smear it, tuck it in, push it, and then I just build, bury the cervical and create a contact. Look at my contact. Remember, I had to create a lone contact. I create a lone contact. But this lone contact, right, is because I don't want to end up with a black triangle. So I place it, and, it, and I do light cure for only three seconds, right? After three seconds, I grab my instrument, I place it in between, and torque it. And I tell the patient, you are going to hear a little crack. And I torque him, they separate and separate the bone. What what happens just what happens if it does bond and you can't get the torque? What will you use? I, I will use a serrated blade. And the serrated blade, I always have to have a serrated blade, you know? Um, because sometimes that happens when you're doing multiple veneers, so it gets stuck more than what you want. I will go with a serrated blade, then place my mylar strip, and then I will like cure it. In that way, I am sure that I am not getting uh, those two stick together. What are the things you can do? Well, like we were talking before, you can do build one tooth first, finish it, so you have a very smooth surface in which the material doesn't stick to it, the second one, or if you don't want to spend the time finishing maybe the first one, you can wrap Teflon tape on the first one. So when you are doing the second one, they don't stick. All right? So by now, you, you, you are asking yourself probably, how do you do the final portion? Well, because I've done one diastema and the facial of the second tooth, I need to do the lingual of this second tooth. And that's what... Um, we call it the use the pull through technique. I will place a mylar strip. The key for this mylar strip is that the mylar strip needs to go between the rubber dam in this case and the tooth. 
So then from the lingual, I am filling this deficiency with composite. Okay? I push them in, and then I'm going to close the band. You can see it right here in the next uh, image coming up, that I am grabbing the mylar strip in one hand, and from the palate, I'm kind of closing, right? And then I'm pulling that matrix slowly towards the facial. And I pull it slowly because the material sticks to the band and brings the materials to the facial. Then I cannot release, I release the matrix from the lingual and let it, from the, from the curved surface that I had, let it get flat. And then I will really fast pull the matrix. So basically you're using the matrix as a tool to yes. move the composite. Therefore, that's why you don't need wedges in between here because you're allowing it to stick to the You're going to have a contact 100% of the time. You try to put a wedge in there, you're going to have a black triangle. You do. You do. Especially you would not be able to feel that embrasure with a, with a wedge. And that's what we... I don't like wedges. It's, it's almost like when you're pulling the matrix, you're like the magician. Yes. Yes, yes, yes. The magician trick that pulls the cloth underneath the silverware or underneath the silverware and the glasses. I, I never tried that one. I don't know if I want to try. <laughs> <laughs> but that's kind of the way it works. So now I have both my uh, teeth built up and I'm kind of ready for my uh, contouring and polishing. So contouring and polishing is quite interesting. And Baba and I just published an article about a couple of months on the um, steps that we need to use to create good contour. Because this is what happened to all of us. We have a resin composite, well, nice adapted. We use all the techniques, good polymerization. And then we look at it, it's like, doesn't look like a tooth. And sometimes we just don't know exactly what to do. So we use a divide to conquer approach to really create good looking shape restorations. So we go, we go to different steps. We go through the length of the tooth, incisal facial line angles, uh, facial contour, line angles, embrasures, point angles, axial inclination, contour, surface texture, and final luster. By doing it this way, we use the Roman principle, the by to conquer. I tell my students, do not look at anything but length. Once the length is correct, move to the next and the next and the next. Kind of is like, Bob, how do you eat an elephant? <laughs> one small piece at a time. <laughs> one bite at a time, that <laughs> right. So what am I doing here is marking my line angle. In the, in, the, in the diastema closure, probably this is the most important part that I can tell you for them to look good. What you want to do is mark both. Where is the line angle? after you build it up, and where do you want to put the line angle? So where you want to, where the line angle is, you go with the side of the pencil. And when you want the line angle is, you go with the tip perpendicular to the surface. So basically, you're allowing the red pencil to point where the, the uh, line angle is, and the blue one is where you want it to be. Correct. So now I know that my line angles, they are not proportional. So I need to grab an instrument and some people might like to use a diamond. I like a diamond for that. Some people like to use discs. And again, different ways to roof a house, right? So again, if you get this part really, 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 really well, um, then you can start going with your polishing. And there is a steps of polishing. You want to go different, different polishes in the market. Very good ones. Optra Pol is really good from um, Iboclar. Um, Jiffy from Ultra Dane is really good. The other one that I really like is Care. Care. Javi Neos from Care, they give you a very, very nice shine. Uh, SAAP from Christian Choice are really good. So now when I'm looking at the adjacent teeth, when I'm looking at contour, in facial contour and depressions, elevations, I want to create the elevations. So I'm painting, I want to create depressions and elevations. So I'm painting my, where I want my depressions, and I will go with a diamond, right? And 
what is the speed? About 10,000 RPMs, that's the one that gives the most control? So basically using your electric handpiece, turning the speed down, having high torque, but low speed gives you the ability to create that surface texturing. Absolutely, absolutely. You, couldn't, you cannot do this as efficiently with air driven that with um, electric hand pieces. So I really love the electric hand pieces. So you go with the fine diamond in the areas you wanna do it. Um, so the na after that, what is follow? Surface texture, right? Because when I look at the adjacent teeth right there, you can see the lines, so I need to create the same because the color is good, but it's not going to look as good if I don't have the shape. So I will do those. And one of the things that, give me a, let me give you a tip here. When you are doing these corrections, you will not be able to see the correction when it's dry. You want to have a wet gauze and wipe it on the surface. And then by wiping, putting a little bit of water, as you can see, it gives you the final result that it should look when you polish, even though it's not polished yet. Then I continue just with a um, smaller grits. This happens to be habineos from Care. Again, one of the good ones out there. And all the things that I want to do is create a final luster. I would look at the adjacent teeth, and the adjacent teeth has a final luster. And that's exactly what I want to create. And this is after using enamelize. That, that's an aluminum oxide paste on a flexi buff. Yes, yes. Th I, to me, this is the best polisher out there. Yeah, you know? I think so too. I, I, I don't have any commercial interest in any of these, no. but um, they're really, really good. That's your final result. Uh, you can see coming up. Um, nice, smooth. You don't see with a composite finish. Again, it's blending reasonably well with all the anatomical characteristics. And that's what it makes the case. That's what I believe makes the case. The good combination of shade and contour. Functionally, of course, you have to adjust your occlusion, make sure that there's, you know, you, and the anterior guidance. And the, the estimate probably is very easy to do that. Uh, interproximally, I want to have a number 12 blade to remove maybe some of the excess of the adhesive that I got it there work with the floss, and like we told you before, I make every single mistake. So sometimes I have left here like an overhand by accident. So it's very difficult to remove it with a burr. So I don't want to put a rotor instrument up here. So I will use this as a Visium Flex from Brassler. And it's a medium grit and really will get in and smooth those um, over the hands that you might have. Then you keep um, cleaning your interproximal. This happens to be Epitex strips from GC. I think they are the best ones. They are thin enough that they are not going to um, break your contact point. You have to be careful. It could, but you can be a little bit careful with um, these strips, very the best strips. And once you done your polishing, you pretty much remove your rubber dam. Once you remove your rubber dam, this is what you want to see. You want to see uh, very nice definition. You, you can see the depressions that we place in there. We can see the surface texture. Also, look at the black triangle, right? I am end up in with a black triangle, but a very little one. What happened? When I pushed the rubber dam, remember, I pushed it, and now it's bouncing back. It's almost like a water balloon, though. You push a water balloon or a beanbag chair, you push it up, and then when you release it, it comes back down. Absolutely right. That's a very, that's a very, very good analogy. And you can see the patient on the side, you can see the groove. The patient comes back uh, for a recall six months later. The gingiva is healed. There's no erythema in there because of the rubber dam. And she's very, very happy with that, um, with that result. Um, and then a higher magnification. You can see those implication lines that really, really imitate. You can see these imitate really well the ones of the adjacent teeth. And the beauty of this is that you don't know where the composite stops. If you closed your eyes and took an explorer, you would know where it starts and where it stops. It blends in beautifully. Correct. And then that's the beauty of this the direct restoration versus indirect restoration. No doubt about it. And again, I know I am not going to finish with a black triangle. 
because the distance from the crest of the bone to the contact point is four or five millimeters or less. Very important for that. So this is the, after a few years, this is her. Uh, believe me, she's not concerned about any of those uh, uh, fraction lesions. And I don't necessarily want to tell her, tell her about it. And when she smiled, she has a pretty good smile and she's quite happy about it. You can see she's happy um, and I'm happy. Good service. And, you know, also, Bob, people will ask, how much you charge for that? Yeah, in my practice, you know, I, I'm not that expensive. I'll, I'll charge anywhere from $800 to $1,000, depending on what I think the time is going to take. And, and I think everybody says that is just way too cheap. You know, and how about you? So what do you even charge in your practice? I charge six, seven hundred per tooth. Yes. Right? Because it's it's um it's a service that I provide. It it takes time. This this one will definitely take you more time than uh that uh even a veneer sometimes is is shorter. So that's like a forty five minute procedure, would you say? Yes. That's what it takes in forty five minutes. minutes. Yeah. Yeah. So again, forty five. That's a good that's a good profit for that. Yeah, and I'm Once, running hygienic. And you're right, yep, so am I. And so you can be profitable with composite. You don't have a laboratory bill. It's just learning how to do it and understanding and, and knowing the armamentarium. And then it comes down to practice. I come down to practice. So um, now we're going to switch a little bit to a class two. Those are more objectives we have. I'm going to go here and discuss a case. And this is a case that uh, obviously there's been repair, there's recurring decay in the mesial. So what we want to do is to um, change that restoration. So isolation-wise, again, what I said before, I like particularly rubber dam, but isolation is make sure that there is no contamination of the working area. So that's what we do. This, this is like bread and butter in my practice. I mean, this is something that I, I don't really enjoy doing it that much, because I'm not getting a, a really great fee for it. So I have to look at it like I have to be able to put this rubber dam on, be efficient in order to be profitable. This can't take you more than 20 to 30 minutes to do a particular case like this because no. you're not getting paid if you're Delta Dental you know, enough. So you want to be efficient. You know what? And look at the rubber dam. You know, we didn't, didn't, didn't mention this, right? But you know, my assistant, we, we have a very good relation and then she, we look at the chart and you know what? There are certain patients in your practice that they want to chat. And there's nothing wrong with that. But but I want to move. I want to yeah. do. So the rubber dam to me is good, especially the patients that like to talk. <laughs> I immediately, boom, put the rubber dam. And they, they talk and the rubber dam is still, but at least you can keep moving. Yes. So, yeah, a little bit about that. So my cavity preparation, modern principles of cavity preparation. What did it say? Remove decay. In composite resin, doesn't have to have a shape by itself. The shape of the preparation is dictated by the decay. And then also dictated by how you're going to um, insert the material and how to going to restore this particular situation. Remove decay, but also you can see in the distal portion, eh, maybe a little flaky, a little flaky right here. It's because I'm very deep. And I don't want to expose the pulp, so... I'm going to leave some demineralized dentin. Yeah, it would be like, um, you know, maybe caries uh, affected versus caries infected. And and I'm with you. If I don't have sensitivity to begin with, I'm not chasing the deepest decay. I'm going to put a liner down, Theracal or or Vitribond or base, you know, a glass ionomer. Yeah, a, bas a glass ionomer, calcium silicate, base, Theracal, things like that work really, really well for this case. And... One of the things that we say is just kind of prepare for also the insertion of the material. And I like to break the contact points because I like to use sectional matrix for cases like this. And a sectional matrix over the over the Toffelmeyer because the shape, the, the round shape of the, the sectional matrix compared to the create a flat contour with the um, Toffelmeyer band. So I like to do this, you know, place a wedge, place the, the sectional matrix, the wedge and the ring to create a good result. What I'm trying to do here is to build up the proximal. Now, some people talk about using flowable in the box. Some people cure the flowable. Some people don't cure the flowable. Some people don't use a flowable. In your experience, 
Do you like using a flowable and how thick is the flowable? So, you know, um, my technique and the, the research, a lot of research technique uh, talks about what is called the snowplow technique. Is injecting a flowable composite and do not polymerize in it. And then you follow with the more viscous material and that more viscous material is going to push that flowable out and then you can wipe it off. But how do you know how thick that flow? I mean, does it all go away? I mean, well, you know what? Let me tell the story, Bob. Um, let me tell the story about that. I um, th that's my question, right? My question is, how much flow is there? Because you know, flow used to be very weak. I don't want to flow in the weaker areas. So what I did, just an experiment, is I dyed my flow green, right? So I dyed it, put them in in a in a structured tube, in a dental form. And then I injected, did everything with the green flowable, and then removed the bandage, inspected. And there was a faint green all the way around, meaning that it's just so little that should not affect the physical properties. What it has to do is improves adaptation. So that's what I like that. And um, the literature, uh, is there a seven-year study um, that they follow these flowables like that at the, bo at the bottom of the box, 99% success rate. I think one of the first people that I ever heard talk about that was Paul Belvedere. Paul Belvedere, Minnesota. Yes, me too. Me too. Rest in peace, Paul. But great yep, clinician. Great guy. Great, great, great clinicians. So um, a little bit about, we need to talk about wedges and rings. There are a lot of wedges out there in the market. And in my practice, I tend to have more than one system because there are so many types, types of embrasures that I maybe want to have a couple. Lately, I kind of like those dual fours uh, or the BioClear. They are about the same. They are just different colors fabricated by the same manufacturer. They, I like them, and that they happen to be like curved wedges. And not only curved wedges go underneath the contact, but also what they have is that they expand as they go through the diamond portion, closes and opens on the other side, and kind of adapts the band on the other side. Garrison, I like Garrison too. Kind of dual force a little bit better. And I do like the, some of the sycamore wedges because you can customize those wedges when you're preparing your, your area. There is a lot of rings in the market. And I will say the two main competitors are the Triodent. And that is uh, Densplite is the owner of it now. And Garrison Dental Solutions. I think, um, and then dual force um, from Vision Shores and BioClear, there's the same ring pretty much. I kind of like the garrison. That's kind of kind of my, my one to go most of the time. If I can, I will immediately move to a dual force. Those are kind of my, yeah. my way to go. I agree. You know, the just a just a little story behind this. These bitine rings and the Paladin system was the first one that was put on the market back in the 70s by Darway Dental. And Darway had made these sectional matrices and 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 rings for, for amalgams. And what would happen is they would do the amalgam, and then when they took the band off, the amalgam would break. And so they put them back on the shelf for 10 more years, brought it back out in the 90s, late 80s, 90s, and, and, and came up with a composite sectional matrix. That's a story I did not know until you told me about it. Yeah, very, inter very interesting. All the, you know, it's just kind of, to tell you, nothing is new under the sun sometimes. So I, I would prefer to do a restoration like this after the wedge, the band, and the ring with a bulk fill material. I do place a flowable, put a more viscous bulk fill material, and do it in a couple of increments, always measuring my depth, because every bulk fill is different in terms of polymerization depth. What, what bulk fill do you prefer? Do you have a particular one you like the best? This, this happens to be, the one that I use nowadays is Filtech One. Yeah, I think that's from, good. From 3M. There's a lot of good yeah, ones out there. Yeah. Yep. But I kind of like that one. It's a, it's a consistent right yep. for me. Nothing wrong with the other ones, and you, I will keep saying consistent is key. So do you have any, do you have multiple shades, or do you use different sh one shade, two? Because for me in my practice, I probably use A2 90% of the time, and maybe an A1 or an A3. What do you what do you do in your practice? Bob, I use A2 all the time. <laughs> <laughs> You're not picking a shade, guys. So A2 is your go-to. You know what? That's good, though, because you know why? The less inventory you need... Yes. Yeah, I don't want to have a lot of inventory. You know, think about it. I like to keep maybe one or two composites, yep. right? Yep. 
because I don't want to keep inventory. Yeah. I have, I want to keep the less, but not inventory for composite, but for everything. Yeah, one flowable or two maybe, yeah. but but not very much inventory. So the polishing that I do, I don't do a lot of anatomy. I don't put groups. I, I put maybe slopes and grooves, but not not secondary anatomy. Not the stains. You don't put any stains in, like no, all those I, people who are lecturing show you how beautiful these are. Yeah, oh, they oh, um, they're beautiful. <laughs> are they practical? Uh, nah. Not in my not not in my practice. You know, mm -hmm. I I cannot charge more than 250, 300 <laughs> for a for posterior composite. Right. You're right. And the insurance doesn't pay you very much either. So yep. that's very interesting. Very, very, very interesting about this. So that's kind of my, um, we have the final restoration there and we polish it to with the bristle brushes. Yep. Those are very good. I don't spend a lot of time yep. in those. Also the research it showed that no matter how you polish it, they are going to get a little rougher. The beauty of this is, and I say this, you have a great contact, great marginal ridge, great polishability. They're paying me $250. They're going to get a restoration that's going to be a great restoration, but it's nothing fancy. No, it doesn't have to be fancy. The posterior doesn't have to be fancy. And, and the beauty of it is, you know, no sensitivity. When's oh. the last time you had sensitivity on a posterior restoration or any restoration? Well, Honestly. You know, I I hear people have sensitivity, and, and, and I believe it, but that comes from the adhesive. Yep, yep. I, I hear people come polymerization shrinkage and things like that, yes, but with these bulk fills, that is being resolved. So a good adhesive system, good utilization of the adhesive is the key for no sensitivity. That's it, I think so. And we want to show a little last case here that I thought that was quite interesting because, you know, um, this is the dentistry that I do all the time too. I don't do fancy cases. I, my, again, I'm insurance-based, but this is kind of real life to me, right? And this is what I take pride on teaching, little techniques, little details. So this patient comes to the, to the office, right? And look at that, he's a 80 um, some year old person and he's got health concerns and he doesn't want to take the tooth out and, but he doesn't want to do a crown. So he says, well, please give me a hand. And I say, yes, I can. So the gingiva is invading already, it was a crack. The gingiva is invading, it's a little staining. Um, so what I do, I have to deal with the gingiva first right here, right? You, sometimes you can get a laser, uh, uh, a blade, or a zirconia diamond to remove it, clean that area, uh, deal with the heme. In this case, it wasn't that deep. So what do I do? I like to pack a retraction core. So when you have here, and I start showing you a diagram of this particular tooth, you know what? Your fracture line is, is slightly infra gingiva. So can I use a rubber dam? No, I can't. So what do I do? I will pay attention right here. Um, I am going to place a retraction core, right? I pack a number um, zero from UltraDent. I'd like the UltraDent uh, cords, ultra, ultra core, ultra, ultra pack, pack. Ultra, ultra pack. pack. And then you can see here, it's right below, my core goes right below the fracture. It doesn't go at the level of the margin like a crown prep when you take an impression. No, it goes below. Why is that? Because now I, when I place my matrix, the core is going to use, be the wedge pushing or closing the matrix against the tooth. So my preparation in this case is basically air abrasion because there is nothing. There's a sclerotic denting that you can see right there. What is the best way to bond to a sclerotic denting? Microabrasion air abrasion. So I do that and then I adapt my matrix. So if I show you now the diagram of that matrix place, you can see it right here. The matrix has been placed but the matrix goes in between the tooth and the retraction core. Now how you put the composite resins there? Well now I'm going to inject, I'm going to uh, etch my enamel available, selective edge, going to place a universal adhesive. And then I'm going to, after applying my universal adhesive and drying and polymerizing it, then I'm going to apply a flowable material, correct? Right here, you can see uh, the diagram and then you can see filling it in. And then you have pretty much your margin, you have elevated your margin. 
Now it's much easier to fill it in. You can now put a wedge right here and then build your contour. And finally, you have a restoration uh, that is for him what you did. So the, I think the beauty of this is if you try to put a wedge in before you put that flowable, you're, it's going to go into your preparation. And so that's why you build that flowable freehand because you need to have that to, to, to wedge against. Correct. Freehand, but I, I'm aided yes. by the matrix, matrix because yep. it goes everywhere too. Yep. And you know, you put a regular composite there instead of a flowable, you push. If you put a regular composite, you push the band. Yep. And then, then you have a mess. Thanks, Marcos. And I'd like to bring Stephen Phelan back for a special announcement today. Thanks, guys. That was fantastic. I think uh, from the comments and the questions, it looks like it was a big hit. I do have a bunch of questions I'd like to ask you in a few minutes. But first, I do have a special announcement because today we're going to introduce you to Composite Mastery Online. And we're also calling this CMO for short, but basically this is our online composite mastery program taught by Bob and Marcos. So if you liked what you saw tonight, if you liked what you saw tonight, you're gonna love this online course because our mission with this online course is to simplify composite resin techniques to make them easy, profitable, and predictable for you in your practice. And if you're interested in you know, expanding your existing composite skills or adding newer composite skills like composite veneers, diastema closures, or even some more advanced composite type of cases that we're gonna talk about in a few minutes, you know, if you're interested in these things, then Composite Mastery Online is specifically for you. And we've designed the CMO curriculum to teach general dentists the step-by-step -step systems that Bob and Marcos have used in their practices to manage basic to complex composite resin procedures. And again, make them predictable and profitable for you in your practice. So we've added a link to the side of the go to of the um, sorry webinar jam control panel. There's a link there now that you can click on that allows you to join Composite Mastery Online. And the URL, if you don't see the link for some reason, is failindentalseminars.com/cmoonlinewj wj for webinar jam. And this gives you an idea of what the platform looks like. And to take you through what's included in these modules, I'm gonna bring back Bob and Marcos and let them explain to you their vision for each of these modules and the overall vision for the course. So as you've seen, we have divided our curriculum, our vision is to have six modules and give you three bonus module, modules. So what we want to do is kind of take you a little bit through the modules. What is our vision for each of the modules? So module one is a, is a state-of-the-art adhesive dentistry. In this module, uh, we're going to talk a lot about everyday adhesive dentistry. We specifically are going to go the step-by-step. -step. When you go through your resin composite daily, right? The least that you want is sensitivity. So that is a big part of what we're going to be talking about. It. Also, we will be talking about how to prevent this restoration from falling off. Believe me or not, I haven't had any restorations coming off. Bob, have you had restorations coming off in your practice? No, very rarely. And when I say this, Marcos, I virtually have zero sensitivity. I cannot remember in the last year when I had any post-operative sensitivity. And it all comes down to the details of which we're gonna cover in depth. If you're having sensitivity and post-op sensitivity, then this is for you. Uh, it's rare to say that you never have something, but I never have sensitivity. Yes, so true. Or, or restorations coming off, especially some of those class fours that they're bonded to enamel, they should not come off. So in this, mod, in this module, you will learn, you know, when and how to use total edge, selective edge, or self-edge adhesives. We're going to classify the adhesives. 
when maybe one is advantageous to use one versus the other one. What about universal adhesives? Most most people talk about them, but you know there is a place for them. There is a way to use them to get the best out of them in sense of no postoperative sensitivity and good adhesion. This is kind of the essence of this program, right? Another part that we also want to touch bases is in class fives. I think a lot of people has problems with the bonding of class fives. And I do believe they are one of the most difficult situations or to restore, but you can do class five restorations and they are not going to come off. We're going to teach you, and they are going to be aesthetic too. So um, moving on to module two, in module two, we're going to talk about composite resin review and selection, instrumentation, in isolation. Yes, rubber dam, we're going to explain rubber dam, we're going to do demos on how to place a rubber dam, but do we believe that the rubber dam is not the only way to get good isolation? I do believe that a good, good isolation, it's maintain the, the field dry, free of contamination, but we are going to teach you other ways, like uh, Pandas, Optra Gay will demo it to you, uh, can I, uh, uh, help you recognize when to use uh, these different type of isolation uh, methods. We're talking about instruments. We are going to let you know about microfields, hybrids. When you use a microfield, micro hybrid, what is the different? Um, when to use these universals? Are there different systems? How are they designed? What are the manufacturer has in mind when they are trying to sell you something? Is it for it's an aesthetic way to do it, or it's a more a functional way to do it. It's for layering, for aesthetics, or it's not for layering, just for one single um, shade or one single opacity. Bob, you want to talk a little bit about what everybody's going to learn in this module? Yeah, you know, um, this module is, is going to lay the groundwork too. Obviously, the adhesives are very important, but it's still confusing for some dentists on what composite should I use. You know, we all have our favorite composites. We're gonna definitely go through the ones that, that we may use more than others. Do we like the handling of this? Do we like the translucency? Because as you've shown me in the past, an A1 from 3M may not be an A1 from Tokiyama, it may not be an A1 from, from Shofu. And how do we select that perfect shade? And how you've done that has been incredibly beneficial for me from a practical standpoint on how to pick a shade in 15 seconds. And, and be right most of the time. Uh, we're gonna talk about cavity preparation. Uh, should you bevel, should you not bevel? W should you use a chamfer? Um, you know, what do we do when we um, are trying to hide different margins? You know, we both layer and we both have used single shades. When can we use a single shade and get away with it? That'll be thoroughly discussed. The other thing that's important that we've always talked about is how to contour finish and polish to mimic two structure because you can have a perfect shade of composite, but if the shape is not right and we feel that the shape can trump the shade, your tooth isn't gonna look like a natural tooth. And so we will be going in great detail and we will be using videos and showing you step-by-step step, a 10 step that, that you and I have published in the Journal of Aesthetic and Restorative Dentistry on how to create the most natural looking uh, restoration. The beauty of this, Marcos, I feel too, is being able to use a visualizer and showing live demonstration as far as from a standpoint of uh, this is how it's done, what instruments work, and you do a beautiful job of using the rubber dam of which I have picked up a lot. The beauty of us doing this course together is every time that we record the module or we have a live webinar, I'm actually learning something that I did not know. So it's it's really been a lot of fun putting this together with you. I oh my God, yes, I agree. We overall we have fun and we enjoy and you know we, we like to teach. Obviously, you know, you love to teach too. So module three, we in module three will dive in detail in the different restorations. We'll talk about class three, class four, and class five. So in this module, pretty much we are going to go the step by step. 
we are going to bring talk about parts from module one module two and put it together in this module three so when we talk about when we talk about a class three we'll talk about how we select the shade for these particular for these particular cases how do we select the opacity are we going to layer are we not going to layer in these class threes and then we'll do class fours and class fives and really this is a step by a step like bob just say in the webinar we'll do a hands-on demonstration of all these we'll do we'll, we'll do a class three step by step uh, actually the class three is one of my favorites because it's, you might think it's a conventional class three that we like to talk about but it goes beyond that in my daily practice some of the class threes that i do are pretty deep right so they are infra gingiva always to the level of the bone uh, some of the class four, like you've seen uh, in the webinar earlier, that we do these techniques, elevate the margins, facilitate the finishing. That's what the things that we are going to specifically demonstrate in this module. So, um, again, Bob, do you want to talk a little more about this or do you want to move to module four? Yeah, you know, I think that the beauty of going through all those and showing it is from a real life perspective. This is not just show and tell. This is actually teaching you and showing you how you can become profitable in your practice. Because you do one diastema closure and you learn how to do that at $800 to $1,200 to $1,500 and do it efficiently, that's all it's going to take uh, to be able to be profitable. And so I think that's very, very important. It'll be very, very thorough. And we'll go on to module four. Uh, you know, managing the black triangles and closing diastemas. The beauty about this technique that we will show in great detail is this is a procedure that is not something that you have to be worried about insurance paying because it's an aesthetic problem and most insurances won't pay for aesthetics. And so you have the ability to charge what you are worth to do these diastema closures. And Marcos, uh, just for instance, what do you charge to, to close a midline diastema and, and approximately how long does it take you to do it? Well, kind of, a little kind of depends on the size and type of the diastema, but I am charging pretty much about 600 per tooth. So I will say 1200 is my fee to close the diastema. And it's a complexity that it takes to do it, but you can do it efficiently. It takes me about half an hour to 45 minutes to close a midline diastema. Uh, sometimes what is more complex takes you in the longer time of 45 minutes, like I said. Uh, but again, you can be very profitable doing this. And one of the things that I learned through the years is the complexity in this, the difficulty of these cases is in getting a good contour. And that's what we're going to give you in this module. Um, you are going to learn what shade, how do you select the shade? Uh, for these diastemas, what type of opacity are you going to use? Because again, some materials come in enamel-like materials, in dentin-like materials, they come in intermediate opacity, body, translucent. We're going to teach you what type of material to select to close those diastemas. We are going to really teach you how to close black triangles. And there are different techniques. So that's part of the what we're going to give you here is different ways to do different scenes. And like I always say, like and I'm, I'm seeing I'm repeating myself two or three times, Bob, when you say you, there are different ways to roof a house. So some way that Bob, that Bob does it, it may know the same way I do it. But again, I think that enriches you to learn and find the most adequate technique to close a diastema, close a black triangle, and also, um, do we use composite? When do we use techniques? Do we heat them? Do we use in cold? When do we use um, modeling resins? How do we facilitate placement? How do we facilitate manipulation of these materials for uh, these black, closing black triangles and uh, closing diastemas? Yes, because Marcos, there are times when I do use a matrix when I'm doing my black triangles and I may heat my composite and we will go in depth closing black triangles using, let's say, the BioClear system of, of showing how to do that um, and being able for you to show freehand techniques. We, we have numerous tips that we will be showing in great detail. In module five, 
we will talk about mastering direct resin composite veneers. I think we always have in our practices, and not necessarily I'm talking about the, um, you know, six or eight veneer cases that what are important, we will talk about it. But sometimes what is difficult is to match an adjacent to it, correct? And that's more difficult than I think doing multiple veneers. Because in multiple veneers, you tend to just use one shade and pretty much everything is going to match because you are using the same composite for all of them. But sometimes what is difficult is doing that single veneer. So we'll teach you both those doing single veneers, how to do multiple veneers, how to manage your time, how to prepare, um, how to, well, from the shade selection, preparation, how much room you need for these veneers. When do you use opaqueers? Do you need, you need to use tints? Yes, we're going to teach you when to use tints, opaqueers. Um, at the same time, we're going to teach you how to manage to do research side by side. I particularly like to do them multiple at a time. And I think Bob may, may be correct if I'm wrong, you like to do it one at a time. And again, I think both ways can be very effective, but you can choose which one probably is going to be better for you. We're going to teach you also diagnostically how to look at these restorations, looking from the face in, trying to, because the goal of this is create aesthetics, smiles, right? Beautiful smile, and that's a, that's a purpose. So we'll teach you from the face, the smile, and then the teeth. How do you finish these restorations? Bob already talked about it. We have a systematic approach because sometimes you look at a restoration you've done and you say, oh my God, it just doesn't look very good, but we don't know why. And the color of the composite can be okay, but then the shape is not right. And then we look and we look and we don't exactly know what's going on. So we'll give you a step-by-step -step approach how to look at this so not only restoration looks good from the point of view of the color, but also from the shape that Bob mentioned, it's very important. What burst, what is speed we're going to use in, what polishing system we're using it uh, with this 10-step um, polishing system. You may see a clinician show you a direct composite veneer, and then what they do is they don't necessarily show you how they finish and polish because that may be their secret on how they make the tooth look good, they may want to keep that to themselves. This course is for you. This course is for us to show you all of the tips and tricks that we know, and nothing will be hidden from our from our uh, participants. I'm glad you're saying that, Bob, because you know I think you and I both take seriously that we say we are teachers, and you're a teacher. There's there's no secrets. I never keep a secret from me because this is not the nature that that what we are, I think, teachers. So, Thank thanks, Bob. In, in module six, then we're going to switch to posterior, right? Um, resin composite in, in posteriors, class twos. This is kind of a, um, a difficult area sometimes to manage, creating good contacts, creating good contours. Since so we are going to talk about step-by-step -step of the class twos. We are going to show deep class twos. We are not going to stay with your typical um, MO Dior restoration. We are going to teach you how to do a multiple of this in line, you know, MO, MO, DOs, MODs. That's what we're going to talk about. It. We're also going to talk about what systems are out there. Are your Toffle Meyer is the one that you need to use. It's contour matrices. When do you can customize your rings to create good restorations? Um, how do you place, how do you select your band? Because we know it comes as small, medium, and large, right? But there are very efficient ways to just immediately, by looking at your prep, measuring your prep, selecting your matrix. So I like to streamline these procedures, how I do it in the clinic, how I'm going to show you, because again, we want to create a speed with these techniques. What systems are available, what bands are out there. Um, also, one of the things for, for a long time I had trouble doing is maybe putting back-to-back -back restorations. Sometimes one will be bigger than the other one, and then I'll have to train, go back, and it was a nightmare. Now we develop techniques, so we will create nice contours and contacts. We'll talk about bulk fill materials. When do you use them? Are they good? Are they bad? 
when, when and how, that's exactly what we're going to talk about. It. What is your preparation design? What are the things that we need to do to create uh, restorations that they are sealed well in there is no white lines? How to deal with deep restorations? Because everybody has them, right? You start going with the burn, the, the radiograph hasn't shown it to you and you end up almost to the level of the bone and then you are like, oh my God, if I do a crown lengthening here, I just compromise it too periodontally, well, it needs to come out, patient is young, I want to extend the life of this restoration. Well, there is a technique called deep margin elevation, and that's what we're going to teach you, how to move that margin up, how to make it easier for you to end up with a good class two restoration, and of course, contouring and polishing. Yeah, so Marcos, the thing, the thing is, you and I know this because I've talked to you about it. Why does my associate, why did he have sensitivity with his posterior composites and I had zero? And we both use the same material, we both use the same supposed technique, yet he had 10 times the sensitivity. So we're going to go in detail how to prevent that. How do you apply the adhesive? Do we use desensitizers? I think that right there is very, very important uh, to understand and to prevent post-operative sensitivity. Do you use flowables? Do you like care the flowable? Do you use snowplow technique? It'll be very, very detailed from, from uh, years of experience. Oh, I love when you talk about, I love that story about your partner. I don't know if we have time right now to talk about it, but very true, you know, why, you, why some people get sensitivity, why other people don't get sensitivity? Yeah, so, you know, those are the six modules and, and Stephen will talk a little bit more about uh, this course. Okay, guys, yes, this looks like an amazing curriculum. A lot of this is already there and built. The rest is being built actively every week over the next little bit. Um, basically, the Composite Mastery Online Curriculum and Coaching Program will teach you the systems to achieve you know, consistent results like these in your dental practice. And results like these in your dental practice. You know, they're going to break it down step by step how to achieve unbelievable results with composite resin. And again, there's been a link added to the side of this page in the Webinar Jam platform. If you need the URL, it's right here. It's just failindentalseminars.com slash CMO online WJ. And I'll say that when we developed this, I had a large part in the curriculum development because I wanted this to be a comprehensive curriculum designed to teach you how to manage simple to more complex composite resin techniques. And I wanted it modeled off of my other programs. So for example, occlusion design or GBR or our endo program, you know, all of these programs have similar curriculum development and they're modular based programs but they're curriculums, they're not just a random collection of videos, and they're also highly interactive coaching programs because each of these programs has a monthly coaching webinar, a webinar series, and the coaching webinars will definitely help you implement the curriculum. They'll definitely help you implement the curriculum. I'll describe more about the coaching webinars in a few minutes, but we also have the opportunity under any of the videos on the membership site to ask questions there. And Bob and Marcos will go in and answer your questions on a regular basis. So really right now you have three choices. Number one is you can do nothing and this was nice and entertaining for you. Number two is you can learn all of this yourself and you certainly can. And um, you can piece together ideas from different people and spend a lot of money taking a lot of different courses. Or you can take kind of the easy route uh, that I would say, the easy button, I guess you could say, and choose to work with Bob and Marcos and use their comprehensive composite resin systems and coaching to help you treat these cases in your practice. I call it the easy button because I don't think it's a big investment. And I also think that, uh, Having it all in one place is very beneficial, and having mentors like Bob and Marcus is obviously invaluable. So what's the investment? CMO is 1997. It's 1997.
but I'll tell you we're having a webinar membership offer for being here and spending the time with us today. We're going to give you a membership offer on this webinar where you can save $500 today to join CMO. And basically it's going to be one payment of $14.95 or if you do want to split it up you can do three monthly payments of $5.55. So 555 now and in 30 days another 555 and 30 days after that another 555. So it saves you a little bit of money by uh, investing uh, 1495 right off the bat. But if you want to spread it out, that's cool. You know, um, after the first month, if you attend the monthly webinar and watch some of the content on the membership site, you'll more than make up your ROI of 555. So you'll make up you know so much more than that that you'll easily be able to pay for the rest of the membership okay so what do other people say about bob and marcos well here's the biggest name in dentistry really dr john coys and he says dr bob margis is a gifted practitioner and excellent teacher who provides the most practical course in direct composite resins i've ever seen and that's dr coys and you know bob teaches a composite course at the coys center and that's uh a $2,000 course and you get no videos after the course to review. So, you know, this online course is even more content than what Bob could teach at the Coys Center. And you have videos for the next year to watch and review and perfect your techniques. So this is a deal really. And another huge name in dentistry, Dr. Newton Fall, says that doctors Vargas and Margis are dynamic presenters who are able to bring science into a feasible practical clinical arena. So, you know, again, this is going to be a practical course, not a lot of, you know, huge amount of literature review and just all didactic. It's gonna be very practical and something you can use in your practice immediately. And then Ed McLaren, another huge name in dentistry, Marcos Vargas is the, a rare individual. He's one of the best composite artists in the world, and he is an incredible educator, teaming up with Bob Margis, who is an outstanding dentist in Marini areas and a very entertaining and motivational speaker, will be a unique course I would love to attend myself. And then their, their mentor, Dr. Jerry Dennehy, says Vargas and Margis a brilliant dental team, especially when you put their bald heads together. <laughs> uh, and then a couple of members just wrote in recently, uh, we've, we've launched this and had a few, well, a bunch of members go through and we closed it and now we are relaunching it again with this webinar today. But a couple of members wrote us just and told us these things, you know, Dr. Paul Branco says that the Composite Mastery Online course has been one of the most practical, informative courses I have ever taken. Being in practice for 30 years, you think you have it all figured out. Then you take one of these courses and realize there are some even better ways to roof a house, as Bob would say. I love learning from truly wet-fingered dentists that are practicing every day like myself. So that's a great testimonial from Paul. And then... Another testimonial from uh, Dr. Lana Wavell, the Composite Mastery course with Dr. Vargas and Dr.